Welcome to the Boardroom Zen. I am your host, Megha Joshi. In this show, we hear the untold stories and best practices from world-class business executives on how they deal with pressure and setbacks in the boardroom and beyond. Yes, these business leaders are no superhumans, but they have found their unique formula to stay grounded and bring their A-game to the table amidst the chaos. So let's begin. Our guest today joins us from Miami, Florida. He's someone who has created great success on the outside while continues to live life to the fullest with a sense of urgency on the inside. For the sake of formal introduction, this guest is a proven leader in the telecom, cybersecurity, and technology space with experience across the United States, Europe, and Latin America. He serves as a CEO of FireMinds, where he leads an incredible team across multiple territories and channels. Last year, he also took an expanded role in ATN International, a publicly traded telecom company where he has full P&L responsibility for the global markets across B2B telecom and managed services. In 2021, he also founded Galorus, a company purpose-built for passion projects related to coaching and investment strategies. He holds an MBA in international business from the prestigious University of Liverpool and has represented Bermuda's international rugby team six times. Wow. Please join me in welcoming Connor McGowan-Smith to the show. Connor, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Big fan of the podcast, so uh, really happy to be on it. Thank you, Connor. It is such a privilege to have you here. So, Connor, we crossed paths sometime last year, and I have to say I have been amazed by your sure personality, the way you carry yourself, your drive, and specifically your corporate trajectory. Would you be able to share some highlights from your leadership journey to give the listeners a feel for who you really are? Of course. Yeah. Thank you. Very kind words in the introduction. And I would say, yeah, in terms of the tra- trajectory, first of all, I'd say like most careers that have, have gone with that trajectory, a bit of luck, a bit of good timing was probably at the at the forefront of it. I've been very lucky with some of the leaders I've had myself both in my personal life and in my professional life. And I would even go as far as to say as inherited a f- quite a strong value system from my my family, which I think has stood me in really good stock. Um, and I think really digging into me a bit is when I was younger, we I was went to different schools, moved around a bit, had family from all over the place. And then my career, I've been lucky enough to work across eight countries. So wow. Um, So uh, lots of learnings along the way, lots of just lots of brilliant people. And I think when I think of my career, I think of the people rather than the the jobs. And that's that's really what I enjoy and what keeps me going. Fabulous. And you mentioned moving around so much, living and working in eight countries. That's pretty incredible. And looking at your journey, I know you originally grew up in Ireland and that's where you are from. And you moved across so many different continents. So tell me more about how that came about. Was that more organically happening for you and opportunities were coming your way or was that more intentional? It was totally random and unintentional and quite a funny story. One of my good pals and probably was a mentor of mine for, for a time, Robin Seal, who was the CEO in Digicel Bermuda, which was my first destination abroad. I'd done some work in the US and Canada prior to that shorter term. Um, but that was really a application that my wife, Juliet, put in for she was interested in moving to the Cayman Islands. Somehow my resume ended up on a desk in Bermuda. And Robin Seal, the CEO, called me and we had a 15-minute chat and I decided to move to Bermuda. And... From there, I've been lucky enough to work in Bermuda, the Cayman Islands, and to work in Jamaica, Guyana, landed in, in the US, um, and been across the Caribbean and in, in Latam. But it all started, to answer your question, it all started with a 15-minute conversation on Harcourt Street in Dublin, which just shows how random these things are. Now, it was not what I was planning at that stage. I was very happy in, in Vodafone, Ireland, where I learned a great deal and were probably content to stay there, but that... 15 minute chat kind of changed my trajectory for the for the next 10 years. That is so unbelievable, Connor. And do you think a piece of that was some sort of synchronicity that you ended up being the right place at the right time with the right person and that chat changed your 
trajectory for good? Yeah, I think by nature, I'm a bit of a risk taker and trust my gut. So just from, from, from that decision, I've, I've left organizations, I think, at the right time. And I've joined organizations at the right time. And it's generally not been an overly planned situation. It's been a gut feeling and say, this feels right. Or this country feels right. Or this place. And I've done that in my personal life as well. But the stars align there, I think, in terms of just that, that, that trigger to, to kind of spark the, the next sequence of events. Clearly. And I have to say that the stars can align for a lot of people. But if we are not ready, we are not in the right frame of mind to capitalize on that opportunity, then it all falls flat, right? So in that moment, you were ready to position yourself to take on the risk and catapult to whatever new opportunities that were coming your way. So kudos to you for that. Totally. I think it's so well summed up. And I'm probably most comfortable when I'm not comfortable, strangely enough. I'm one of those people, I think you are too, from some of our previous conversations that likes to push the boundaries a bit, likes to to feel that I'm moving forward all the time, even if that feels uncomfortable. So that kind of aligned with a bit of a risk-taking attitude. And as I said at the start, big amount of luck and timing is, is hugely important for these things. Yeah. And you're too humble to say that. And with, you know, looking back at your personal life, were there any early experiences that made you take one more risk in your life in the later half? Yes, yeah, it's a great question. I'd say if you ask my parents, pro I probably drove them crazy for a couple of years because the subjects in school, for example, interested me, but the education system just completely disinterested me. So I was always not really conforming to what I should be doing, but at the same time, really interested in some of the subjects I was learning. But I think if I go back, I was lucky enough, I went to a very good school in Dublin, Belvedere College, which in addition to just being a strong academic school, they did really focus on extracurricular things like sports. To be fair to my mum, she may, used to make me do the school plays against my will, but I really enjoyed them doing them. So I think that from an early age, I kind of had an interest in everything and that stood me well going into adult life. Lots of early experiences of Generally, if you try, they work out and you enjoy them and you learn. So I've kind of taken that into my adult life. Yeah. So the early exposure kind of gave you a head start into your career and it just built some traits that set you up for success later on in life. 100%. Yeah, 100%. And as I said, in terms of I have three sisters as well. So I get on really well with my three sisters and only boy. And I think we were all, I, a lot of the times I had to kind of entertain myself as a boy and then try not to annoy my sisters too much. And we just had great experiences. We used to go away to say the Irish speaking district in Ireland every summer to learn Irish and just experiences like that. I think they're out of your comfort zone when you're that young, but they're great fun after a few days. And if you can try and take some of that a childlike thinking into your everyday life when you're an adult, there's a huge, huge benefit to doing that and thinking like that. And it gets harder the older you get, but try and stay true to it. Yeah, yeah. And, and very well said. And I have to agree with that, Connor. The playfulness that we have inherently as a child, it somewhat disappears as we start to mimic certain personalities and behaviors in the hopes of looking Smarter, wiser, more intelligent, more collected. Having said that, the creativity that comes with, with that playfulness is, is pretty incredible. And it's, it's important to continue to tap into that time and again. And I also have to say that Galway in Ireland is one of my favorite cities in the world. So I'm so jealous of you spending your early years in Ireland. <laughs> yeah, I think the, the best pint of Guinness in Ireland is in O'Connell's pub in Galway. Brilliant place. Brilliant place. Great fun. Lovely. We'll have to have another set of beers next time I'm in Ireland. Totally, totally. Yes. And so, Connor, you grew up in Ireland and then you moved around, right? You said you, you've lived in eight different countries. I know you spent considerable time in in the Caribbean and now in the United States, is there anything in particular, whether it's cultural or otherwise, that you had to overcome as you were moving around and embracing what was new? Yes, there is. I think they, the biggest learnings, I think, as someone moving abroad or moving to different countries and doing it a few times, is you probably get to understand your own biases. 
and you're you probably get to understand your own shelteredness of where you're originally from. A consistent theme I found in moving to different places and working with different countries is there is always an initial period where you're the outsider and potentially nobody knows why you're here. Nobody knows if they trust you or not which is just human nature. I think that the second or third time you move, you learn that that's nothing personal. It's just how, how people interact. But I think largely I've been very lucky. I was in Bermuda for a long time. I fully integrated with society. Huge amount of respect for the Bermudian people. They welcome me with open arms. I've never lived in Guyana, but I do a huge amount of work with Guyana and I go there regularly. Again, been going there for about five or six years. Just totally love being part of the the, the culture and part of the part of the team there. Yeah, so I think the big learnings for me is just to probably go into new territories, either if you're living there or working with them, with an understanding that the culture is going to be different to what you're used to. And you have to be respectful of that and and aware of it. And generally, if you are respectful to it and aware of it, it, the, the respect is reciprocated the other way. And that brings me to the next space of networking and relationship building and would love to hear more about the impact networking has had on your own professional success so far. Yeah, great question. It's So I started my career in sales and sales will always be a big part of what I do and I generally gravitate towards sales type activities. So it's some, I, I would say I'm an extroverted introvert if I was to label myself. I get a huge, <laughs> I get all of my energy from people and interacting with people. But sometimes at the end of the day, I'm totally exhausted and it, it drained me. But where I, I think in terms of answering your question directly, where I think networking is really, is really hard to understand is building meaningful relationships rather than just having relationships. So I think from a corporate or a business perspective, it's a real relationship with someone you can text or call or send a message and informally. And that's kind of focusing on building meaningful relationships with people you deem to be important. And then the second aspect of it, I think, is being willing to give as much as you get. There's nothing worse than networking or being very obvious to say you're targeting something with an objective in mind being able to to give back and being open. And I think it's it's probably something that's become increasingly more difficult since since COVID. Difficult in one sense that all of that face-to-face meetings went away, everyone works all over the place then. But then in, in another way, looking at it, probably more accessible because people like we're on now in terms of video link and and remote working is 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 a lot is a lot more common but probably puts a little barrier into building those meaningful relationships. So long winded way around of asking, yeah, I think networking massively important, something I like to do and something that I think needs just constant work and adoption to, to, to how you improve at it. Yeah. And do you intentionally bake in time for networking just outside of your immediate organization or vendors? I'm just trying to understand if there's particular strategy you have in mind and you try to engage with X number of people a month or year or what have you? 100%. I think from a professional sense, try and bring in one motivational speaker to staff each month. That is for just to get to offer to staff a, a voice outside of the day to day. Selfishly, it just allows me something that I have to work on each month to go and contact these people and interact with these people. I try from my personal perspective, I try to have at least two meetings a week with people outside of the professional day to day. And then from a professional perspective, one of the lessons I think I've learned that has stood me well is I will openly give out my cell number to anyone who wants it. So if I meet someone for the first time, my cell number is on my business card. If I'm meeting with someone internally, I'll say, text me at any time, call me at any time. I think doing that, it cuts a lot of corners in terms of networking, just being open and saying, look, let's let's forget about email, forget about scheduled meetings. Anytime you need me, just call me. And yeah. you will just see, sometimes I wake up and there's 10 messages just from people saying, I need this, or can we chat? And again, it can be exhausting at times, but it, it, it solves a purpose in terms of making sure you're constantly connected with, with people. Yeah. And that's such an interesting and powerful way of Letting people know that you're open to them, that you don't necessarily have barrier sort of intentionally built around you, right? Which is very interesting. When I moved here from India, that was back in 2010, I, I spent a big majority of my early years in India. And I moved to the Ohio State University to get an MBA. And 
In that university, during the business school years, we were taught about the power of networking. We were forced to go out on into networking events and build new connections. And then thereafter, when I went to Deloitte Consulting, exact same situation where we were asked to go out and network with clients and peers and get to know people and build deep relationships, not just superficial ones, but deep relationships. And that, I think for me, changed my point of view towards life and how I showed up and how I started to bring those barriers down that I had before in my early years. I'm just curious in in learning about the Irish way. And were you exposed to networking early on? I think, yeah, I think Irish people probably drink too much, but uh, is part of that <laughs> culture is it's a culture of being communal and and getting together and so I think that stands you in good stock. I also had, I was very lucky and probably in, in school, I have a very impressive group of friends. Now we, and probably if you looked at us in school, we weren't all that impressive, but all of my peer group have kind of went on to do pretty amazing things. So that organically introduced you to an amazing group of people, the people they started to interact with. But in terms of answering your question, I mentioned to you before we went on is my, my nephew is currently here with me on work experience. So he's. He's over from Ireland. And one of the things I'm trying to be very intentional with him is probably that I never got taught this in school is that aspect of networking and attitude and work ethic. And and then he's a desire to go into finance. So it was just really interesting to sit with him with the finance team yesterday and explain what finance actually is. I think for myself, probably in school, I, I had no idea of that. I was I wanted to be a lawyer. What I didn't read a whole ton when I was in school, so that didn't make any sense. But again, so in Ireland, it's not taught particularly well at an academic level, but Irish people, like Indian people, are pretty sociable and, and pretty able to, to transfer that to kind of American culture and, and European culture. Right. And I have to say, Connor, you, you were not meant to be a lawyer. You were meant to be right here in the telecom technology <laughs> I, space. I, I agree. And, and that's the way the universe had it for you. Next, Connor, I'd love to dive into how you practice self-care, how you keep yourself in high performance states with all the travel that you do and so many activities that you engage in. The amount of energy that takes is significant. So tell me more about that. Yeah, great question. It's ongoing. And I think the routine is the biggest factor, I think, for me, for energy and well-being. And my, my wife is a pretty good policewoman of, of that because I have a habit of looking at my free time in two months time or three months time and filling it with something. So I think routine and rest. I've never wrote a book, but I would love to write a book one day. And I think I would call it walking the dog. So the, the mornings I get up and walk my dog, I don't take, look, don't look at my phone, walk him for about 40 minutes, take him to the park. It, once I do that every morning, generally the rest of the day is a much better day or the day at least starts a lot, a lot better. And then exercise, just all the usual things. They seem really rest, exercise. And then I think on the professional side, probably learning to say no of it is one of the big things I've learned probably in most recent years and the latest roles I've been in is you can't please everyone. You can't say yes to everyone. And by... And by that, I mean, really trusting the team around you. There was, we did, we had some consultants in, in January doing some mission alignment, a really powerful work we did with the wider team. One of the things that really stuck with me with, particularly in leadership roles or management roles is delegating until you're uncomfortable. So you have to balance both sides is if you're going to give yourself time to rest and for well-being and other things, you have to make sure that you are actually practicing that in, in work and, and trusting people and, and delegating work. And then at the same time, being available when those people need you. Right. Wow. Such great strategy, Connor. I'm glad you shared all that for the listeners. And I have to say, as a firm believer in mind-body connection, I know how important it is for us to nurture not just our minds by reading and staying busy, but also nurture our bodies because there's this deep linkage between the two. And if we only nurture one, then there's a state of imbalance and we can never be in that truly high performing optimal state that we are meant to be in. And so that truly resonates with me. And I know how how priceless those 
morning walks with the dog are. And I, yeah. I follow the same routine and he keeps me very active. Totally. And honestly, it's the other part, I think, because I'm getting a bit older. I, I'm huge sports, love playing sports. I play rugby, play like five-a-side soccer. I'm, I find I'm getting injured a lot more just as I get older. So that just not being able to play sports the last couple of years from a couple of injuries substituting that with something else. And that can be as simple as walking the dog or try and play a bit of golf. But I think simple things like being outside is, and I know you're a big practice and I follow you on LinkedIn and your posts are awesome just in reminding us how to actually do that. Thank you, Connor. So Connor, with, with your experience of where you've spent so much time in different corporate boardrooms across organizations and you continue to what would be that one piece of advice you would give to an aspiring executive for success? Ooh, good, very good question and something I am learning all of the time. So I've, I've done many, many board meetings. Some super performed really well. Some absolutely tanked, almost laughed out of the, laughed out of the boardroom. I think one of the biggest lessons I learned, and I know like myself, you have an interest in, in coaching and you coach people and have been coached. One of the biggest lessons I learned from a coach that has worked with me is going into a board meeting, not assuming that the board knows all of the detail and the day to day and things that, that you as a leader or the people presenting to the board, it seems so simple. But you need to take probably communication up a level. And then the second thing, as I say, in the boardroom, they're quite a cold corporate place. So it's being aware of that and not taking feedback personally. Generally, the board is there for your benefit. And really understanding if the numbers are good, it's going to be a good board meeting. If the numbers are bad, it's probably going to be a bad board meeting but really focusing on explaining why numbers are good and why numbers are bad and what the action plan is. But it's a constant learning place all the time. And it's the really hard side of corporate life, trying to explain your whole strategy and your whole business in a couple of hours to people who are just seeing a snapshot of snapshot. Of. So long way around of answering your question, learning all the time. I had a board meeting as, as recently as just Tuesday, just gone, just back from Atlanta, went well. So we'll last one is good. So you're only as good as your last board meeting or your next one. So in, in, in a good place with them at the moment. Yes. And I agree a hundred percent. We're only as good as our last performance. So as leaders, as executives, as people, we're constantly reinventing ourselves and upping the game. And what I also heard you share there is bringing some element of simplicity into our communication and not assuming that everybody knows the jargons or not assuming they know the day-to-day. -day. And so, which is why there's this sense of responsibility put on the shoulders of those leaders walking into the boardroom to be able to tell that compelling story and put those pieces together so it all makes sense. Perfect. You said it a lot more eloquently than I did. Well, I 100% agree with that. And I think is, it's also, I think in, in a board setting, Generally, the board members are on your side. It might not seem like that sometimes because if you take the feedback personally, but generally, if you treat it in that way, this is a group of people who are trying to provide direction and trying to trying to help and, and accepting that help when, when needed. And then, yeah, I think it's simplicity. And also, I would say a big part of it is transparency and honesty. There is a propulsion, particularly in people like myself who have a sales background, to go in and tell a positive story all the time. A lesson I've learned is if it's a bad, if something is not going to happen, just call that out. And again, just tell them, tell what the plan is. Right, right. Wow, great discussion, Connor. And my last question to you is, is there any book that you're reading or a book that you would recommend to the listeners here? Yes, I, I'm an avid reader, I think like yourself. One really powerful book for me was a book called A Man Thinketh. It's from the early, it's early 20th century. It's a, it's a short book, but it's amazing how relevant it is still today. And it's all really the concept of it is how a, a single thought, can, if, it's, if it's not recognized and, and, you, and, and considered, can become an action, can become a habit. And it's just a really powerful way of looking at it. And then probably the other books, if I was to call them out, is The 48 Laws of Power is a book I read recently, which again is 
a book around modern day politics and how power works, but it gives example of Chinese emperors, Roman emperors, and just human nature when it comes to power. It's a, again, fascinating book. And then one more, if you'll allow me, is, is Outliers, sure. a book I read recently. It really goes into detail about how the date you're born and where you're born is so important to how your life shapes and actually how you, how you, how you navigate around that is, is, is really important. So yeah, there, there are three books that pop to my mind when you ask that question. I love it. And I'm adding all those three books to my reading list. So thank you for sharing. And they all touch on different dimensions. And I, I love the diversity there. Super, super. And so Corner, as we come to close, any last words you'd love to share with the listeners? Yeah, I think, Rega, I'm a big fan of the podcast, a big fan of everything you're doing and totally inspired by your own journey in terms of how you've made that transition from a really successful corporate life into what you're now would ultimately success. So just a big thank you for allowing me to, to come on the podcast today. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Connor. It's been such a privilege to have crossed paths with you in the past year. And I, I cherish this relationship and what a delight to have you come join my podcast. Thank you. Thank you. There is no better time than now to build resilience, lead mindfully and with purpose. We all deserve to live our very best life. This show is brought to you by The Resilient Human, a company on a mission to develop authentic leaders that thrive amidst pressure and have the courage to write their own story. A sincere thanks to all my listeners for the precious time and presence. If you genuinely enjoyed the show, I'd love for you to subscribe and leave a review on your favorite listening platform. Be well, and I can't wait to see you at the next episode of The Boardroom's End.